have uh, Monica Schleier Smith, who will be talking about programmable non local interactions towards fast scrambling with cold atoms. Thanks Monica. so much for the invitation to be here. Um, I have to say, I'm always a little bit intimidated um, in talking to an audience that is um, perhaps all theorists. Um, but I, I spoke at a sort of similar conference about a year ago, and somebody told me afterwards that my talks was relaxing because I showed a lot of pictures. So <laughs> I will try to do that again <laughs> um, and make this a little bit of a change of pace. Um, so indeed, the title of the talk is Programmable Non-Local Interactions, and the subtitle to motivate it um, for all of you is Towards Fast Scrambling with Cold Atoms. Um, but the work I'll talk about, it's really part of, I would say, a kind of um, larger um, vision or dream that I have that I will one day in my lab kind of have some sort of a, um, what we call an arbitrary waveform generator, but for quantum mechanics, where I can program in, I would like to um, study a particular quantum state or Hamiltonian today. And ideally, I would love to just press some buttons and um, um, press play and um, watch, how, watch how it evolves, perhaps. Um, so, so for you, you know, maybe the quantum state you would like is something like, let's say, this uh, thermo field double state, or maybe the Hamiltonian you would like is something like this um, SYK model here. Um, but more broadly, um, so you know, it, it might seem like this is something that's impossible to do to have like a function generator for quantum mechanics. Um, but actually, the field um, of of cold atoms is getting to an exciting point where there is a high degree of programmability of quantum systems that we can uh, realize in the lab. Um, and what I've shown you here are some pictures from actually um, other labs around, around the world. These are not from my lab, um, where people are actually, for example, able to take individual atoms, each of which might encode a qubit, um, and um, position them in optical tweezers uh, and um, image them at this single qubit level. Uh, uh, and have a, a high degree of control over 1D, 2D, and even three-dimensional systems. Um, and this is starting to get at this idea of, of programmability. Um, but in order to really make this a, 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 as powerful a tool as we would like, there's a second ingredient we need to start to study, let's say, quantum many-body physics, which is the ability to also um, program something about the interactions. Um, and that's actually the focus of my talk today, um, is can we sort of draw inspiration from this idea of using laser light for a high degree of control um, to start programming actually the interactions between these laser cooled atoms. And in particular, um, uh, what is valuable is to be able to engineer systems with interactions that are long ranged compared to the micro micron scale wavelength on which it's possible to trap and image atoms. Um, and in my lab, we actually work with um, two different systems that allow you to do this. Um, the, the focus of my talk today will be on a system where we have atoms that can talk to each other over kind of millimeter scale distances um, by scattering photons amongst each other. So photons mediate interactions that can actually be long range and even highly non-local in character. And that opens up some um, really interesting kind of new directions in quantum simulation. Um, if I have time at the end, I'll touch a little bit on a second system where we have um, more local types of interactions that are still um, optically controlled. Um, so I'll just say, just for context, it, we're actually interested in my group in, in a number of different directions, um, which could be end programming the interactions to make particular entangled states that have some useful application, let's say in quantum sensing, programming the interactions perhaps to realize some Hamiltonian whose ground state um, uh, maps to finding where my finding the round state maps to solving some classical problem. Um, uh, so that's kind of a computation direction. Um, but my focus today will be on um, simulation. So building some interacting system um, that might be a toy model for something that you would think would be hard to study in the lab, um, let's say quantum gravity. Um, so the hope that we could even um, think about doing this stems from the idea of holographic duality. Um, this uh, duality between a, a quantum many-body system in uh, the spatial dimensions and a uh, uh, system with, with gravity in one additional spatial dimension that encodes something about the structure of, of entanglement in my quantum system. Um, so uh, this is sort of, to me, this is uh, a beautiful concept um, because in general sort of thinking about entanglement in generic quantum many-body systems um, thinking about how I should describe quantum many-body states 
given that I need an exponentially large density matrix is extremely intimidating. And the idea that there are some cases where there's some simple um, geometric picture that could emerge um, is, is attractive for me, actually, from the perspective of um, will this give us new ways of thinking about quantum many body dynamics? Um, so that raises the question, are there systems um, with holographic duals either known or to be discovered um, um, that we could probe in the laboratory? Um, are there ways of probing that emergent geometry? Um, are there simple models or models with a simple holographic description that can provide some insight um, and that, that can guide us towards sort of an understanding and a visualization of a wider range of sort of generic quantum many body systems that we might study in the lab? So those are to me kind of the, the motivating principles. Um, and if we want to think about systems with a simple holographic description, my understanding is that the simplest for all of you to think about is a black hole. Um, and the black hole, um, from the quantum mechanical perspective, I should think of as a maximally chaotic quantum system in which information can spread exponentially fast from one qubit to all degrees of freedom. Um, so that, um, I, I like that. That's a, a sort of concrete prediction that sounds like it might be um, uh, testable and measurable in experiments. Um, so one thing that we've been thinking about is, is this a process um, that could be studied in the lab? And um, so as a starting point, I find it useful to have some Hamiltonian written down that is theoretically understood um, to be a fast scrambler. And so here's one example, um, is this Sachdevier-Kataev model um, that features um, highly non-local um, random uh, interactions and, uh, and, and uh, hoppings of, of fermions. Um, that looks somewhat exotic if I think about realizing this in some atomic system. Um, thinking about atoms hopping in a non-local fashion is something that um, sounds hard to do. Um, but one thing we'll be, um, I'll talk about is can we sort of realize um, models, maybe not exactly this, but models of this flavor. Um, Another model from which we can draw inspiration is actually one that um, one of our, our speakers from earlier in the day um, had um, seminal papers on, which is thinking about um, uh, what happens if you have sort of a, a billiard system that lives. Um, so it's actually something local. There's a random walk type of dynamics that are happening, um, but it's local, not in a geometry that I am familiar with uh, or, or uh, or would normally sort of encounter in the lab, but in some um, very exotic, what's called an ultrametric geometry, which I can basically think of as um, the billiard moves on some kind of a tr an infinite uh, tree graph. Um, and so generally this is um, saying if I can start to realize quantum dynamics on some um, more exotic graph than just you know, a, a 1D or 2D system that you might more naturally realize in the lab, um, that could also be a route to realizing uh, fast scrambling. So um, I, at this point, I have to say, uh, you know, where did I first become introduced to this um, idea on the right of um, uh, the tree graph? And um, this is something that I learned about from my collaborator, Steve Gubser, who I think um, hopefully many of you knew. This is actually his um, picture from the Simons website. And um, what he explained to me is that um, sort of the, a, a really deep question worth thinking about is trying to understand sort of what is the mathematics underlying the reality that we experience as smooth space-time, but which we think in all likelihood fundamentally really should be discrete. And so this was for him um, a motivation for thinking about actually um, a tree graph as essentially um, some discretized model of curved space and gravity. And so the picture here is that one can have um, uh, a system that has, let's say, n sites. Um, and if distance is measured along this tree graph, then the lar largest possible distance um, between two of these sites only goes logarithmically as the system size. And so I can think of this um, as kind of a discretized model for, for a, a space with negative curvature. Um, so that uh, is something that, again, looks like it could be interesting for, for fast scrambling, um, uh, but um, uh, or for some toy model of quantum gravity, you might think this is not something that's natural to study in the lab. Um, but actually, I will say that while there have been some experiments with superconducting circuits asking, can you build these types of graphs um, in, in, uh, by wiring together superconducting resonators in the right geometry? Um, one thing that 
we uh, have thought about on the theoretical side and in collaboration with Steve is, can you actually build these types of models with um, cold atoms? And um, I won't, uh, I won't uh, show you experiments on a tree graph today, but I'll show you what I think is a really exciting toolbox that is moving us in the direction of being able to do this. So um, the kind of outline for, for my talk is that I'll be intra introducing a system where we have really a high degree of programmability of interactions between spins that are encoded in cold atoms um, using light that mediates those interactions. And I'll start by talking about how one can realize sort of um, highly non-local all-to-all interactions that are in some sense similar in spirit to what you saw in that SYK model. Um, and then I'll move on to having an even higher degree of programmability of the interactions that um, is partly inspired by the vision of being able to realize something like quantum mechanics on this tree graph. Um, and at the end, I'll give a bit of an outlook to roots of actually probing um, many body chaos in these and other systems. Okay, at this point, I think I will actually just briefly pause and ask whether there are any questions on what I've said so far, although it was only an introduction. If not, that's fine. Um, but I, I want to not totally talk to an empty screen, so I'll try to pause a couple of times throughout the talk and be happy to take questions at any time. Okay, so um, as a sort of as a starting goal, we can ask the question, um, can we realize in the lab um, models in this flavor of SYK where we have some kind of non-local dynamics? And um, this is something that is um, hard to do if what you want is sort of particles that are hopping, massive particles that are hopping non-locally, but turns out to be relatively natural to do in a system that we can build where um, the, uh, what is hopping are spin excitations and the hopping of these spin excitations is mediated by photons. Okay, so again, we won't be building exactly this SYK model, um, but what I'll show you is that we can realize systems where we have um, some, um, flip-flop interactions that I can think of as, as a spin excitation hopping, and those flip-flop interactions will be able to couple sort of any site with any other. The basic approach that we take is um, I think of an atom as um, something where the spin-up state is an occupied site, the spin-down state is an empty site, and um, what I would like to do is have a process where that spin excitation can be converted to a photon, and that photon can be converted back into a spin excitation in another atom. And if I can do that, since the photons can easily travel over long distances, I can have very long range hopping of these excitations. In order um, to have that process of exchanging the photon be coherent and not have the photon fly off in a random direction, um, what we do is we trap our atoms in an optical resonator, um, which essentially is a, a box for the photons um, that gives us strong atom light uh, interactions. And in order to have the interactions be optically controlled, we send in a laser field that drives a process where if the control field is on, the atom can absorb a photon um, uh, and uh, uh, access some optically excited state, which is far off resonant, but the resonant process involves absorbing a photon from a drive field, emitting it into this resonator, another atom absorbing that photon and re-emitting it um, into the, into the uh, control field. But in this process, that process of one atom scattering the photon to the other, um, we have one atom flip its spin and the other atom flip its spin in, in concert and get this spin exchange interaction. So that's the concept. And um, this general concept of having some interactions mediated by light already has some track record, I should say, in, in areas ranging from engineering, um, very um, sort of collective entangled states um, that benefit from the ability to have any atom talk to any other with applications in, in quantum enhanced measurements, um, all the way to quantum simulations, um, uh, enabling access to, to phenomena like super solidity that might seem not so easy to, to access in the lab, but that these non-local interactions can help with. Um, one key ingredient that we've been adding to these experiments is the ability to um, locally, um, uh, pro locally manipulate and detect the magnetization in the system and that's great for studying dynamics and ultimately being able to ask some questions about how information spreads in the system. Um, so the experiment uh, looks something like this. We have basically these, these cold atoms are trapped um, in individual, uh, basically, uh, sites of, an, of a standing wave. 
Um, and so spatially, the atoms are pinned. Um, and the dynamics will be purely in the spin degree of freedom. And in most of what I'll show you, in the, the first experiments I'll show you, we just have um, a, an extended cloud of atoms that's um, sort of millimeter scale. And um, I'll think of this as a one-dimensional system and ask how the spin excitations um, behave in this one-dimensional system. And so first of all, just to show you that we can generate this um, non-local hopping of the excitations, here's an experiment where we initialize some excitations at sort of region A um, by sort of driving a local spin rotation in this cloud um, and watched as a function of time where the spin excitations go after we turn on the light that turns on the interactions. And you can see this oscillation in region A and you can also see some spin excitations appearing here in region B. Um, and actually the fact that the spin excitations um, suddenly end up over here is it's not obvious why that should happen. It's some indication that this interaction is very non-local and if I wanted to calculate and figure out why is it that the spin excitations um, suddenly go from A to B, um, I would actually calculate the pairwise interaction between any two sort of pixels in this image um, based on the local intensity of, of the cavity mode. And I would find it turns out that the intensity of the mode is actually very strong here. And so the interactions of these A atoms are strongest with this B region, and that's where the spin excitations go. So this is something that we can understand very well. And so far, um, the structure of the couplings is really just given essentially by the local intensity of the cavity mode at the position of any given atom. Um, some directions that we you know, want to be able to go with this system are having more control over the um, spatial structure of the interactions. Um, so just to give sort of a flavor for that, um, what are some things you might want to do? In the simplest case, if we don't do anything fancy, like in the experiment on the previous slide, um, the interaction that we have is any atom can talk to any other. Um, there's some non-uniformity in the strength of the interactions having to do with the structure of the cavity mode, but it's not a completely random graph of interactions. There's um, essentially the, the interaction between any pair of atoms is the product of couplings to the cavity mode. So this is a separable form of interaction. Um, and this is something that theoretically gives rise to some um, kind of slow thermalization, um, but not to fast scrambling. Um, so you need somewhat more control over which couplings are there and how strong they are um, to, to expect to see fast scrambling. Um, what are some other forms of interactions you might want? Um, actually, something we've been thinking about in the context of quantum optimization are one-to-all couplings, but I'll just mention this is also there are um, theoretical works by uh, Andy Lucas, for example, asking about how um, uh, quantum information is scrambled on this sort of a star graph. That's also something that um, might be natural because I have a coupling of this one cavity mode to many atoms. Um, I, I motivated earlier um, that we might want to study quantum dynamics on, on a tree graph. Um, and one other sort of form of interaction that's actually interesting is being able to have some interplay of short range um, local interactions plus long range interactions. Um, and so in recent work, for example, by Brian Swingle and Alexei Gorshkov, they've shown that if I have this everybody talks to everybody, as could be mediated by this single cavity mode, plus some local interactions, um, that is actually enough to give rise to um, fast scrambling. Um, and um, yeah, so, so those are you know, some, some directions that one might want to go. And I'll get to that um, later to asking how do we control the spatial structure. But actually, before I do, just to give you a flavor of the types of measurements we can do in this system, I want to say a little bit more about the control we have over also the form of the interactions. So for example, we can control are these um, Ising interactions or are they spin exchange interactions that I think of as the excitations hopping. Um, and also um, that we can control easily the sign of the interaction. Is it ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic? Um, so I'm, I want to kind of give you the, the full um, picture of, of the toolbox that we have. Okay, so we'll start with these. So we'll start by considering the system I showed you so far where we have all to all, was there, did somebody say something? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry for the interruption. Uh, I just wanted to get some more clarification as to what you meant by tree like uh, uh, interaction. Uh, you mentioned about something related to uh, can we move to the previous slide? I'm sorry for the interruption. Yes, yeah, and I will say a little bit more about it later, but I can, is this oh, the yeah, one or uh, did you want the earlier one? Yeah, the, oh, I just want uh, to know something about what you meant by fast scrambling in tree-like diagrams, which you have in the third picture. Yeah, okay, so I will say a little bit more about this later. 
But the general concept is that if I have um, a system where um, I can think of the uh, distance, which I, let's say I think of um, things that are strongly interacting as being closer together and things that are you know, weakly interacting as further apart, right? Um, so I, if I think of this distance on this tree graph um, as saying something about the strength of interactions, um, you can ask basically um, how long will it take for some information to propagate from one site to another. And because the depth of this tree is only logarithmic in the system size, um, this gives a framework for having something where that um, time for sort of information to get from one point to another is only logarithmic to the, in, in, the, in the system size. And that is a, a feature that's conducive to fast scrambling. Okay, so we would be studying systems which are analogous to uh, the tree diagrams. Yeah, and so, but exactly how you do that is, is maybe not obvious, and I'll, I'll say more about sort of prospects for doing that um, towards the end. Okay, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Great. Were there other questions at this point? Okay. Good. So um, I will focus first just on this, the simplest form of interaction that we kind of naturally get in this system, which are these, these JIJs are of this product form, um, and ask about um, kind of the, the other knobs on our function generator, which are the, the form of the couplings and the sign of the couplings, and just show that these are things that we can control. And actually, um, this was motivated, starting to explore those, those knobs was motivated um, by actually a collaboration with Ehud Altman. Um, asking kind of what is the dynamical phase diagram of these simplest types of all-to-all -all interactions that are naturally realized for atoms coupled to a single mode of light. Um, and that um, does not give rise to fast scrambling, but does actually um, is predicted to have some interesting features um, where depending on the relative strength of the um, spin exchange interactions and the Ising interactions, um, it could be an integrable model. If I either have pure spin exchange interactions or an isotropic Heisenberg model. These are these blue lines. Um, or um, if I, if I uh, am in some other regime of the relative strength of the spin exchange and Ising couplings, um, there are some somewhat actually puzzling features where classically the model looks chaotic. Quantum mechanically, it seems to give rise to some kind of a, a slow thermalization. Um, and um, so if you, for example, can also change something about the length of the spin on a site, which might just be by controlling the number of atoms on a site in a discretized lattice type of a model. Um, there's kind of a rich phase diagram to explore here in terms of how, the, how this system thermalizes. Um, so this kind of motivated us to just ask, is this actually a knob that one even can realize in the experiment, this tunability of the anisotropy and spin space of the interactions? And um, a neat thing is that this is a knob that we have. Um, and in particular, it's a knob we can control just by varying um, the orientation of a magnetic field relative to the axis of the resonator. So here's an experiment where we've basically, by tuning the orientation of a magnetic field, we measure this Ising coupling and the spin exchange coupling, and we can um, tune them to any, any ratio that we want. And actually just by controlling a laser frequency, um, so, so the field determines the form of the couplings and the sign of the interaction ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic is something we also control just by virtue of a laser frequency. Um, just to give a flavor for like, what are the measurements we actually do to extract these couplings? Um, so, you know, if I want to measure the Ising coupling in the system, the type of thing we can do is we can actually control um, the initial spin texture in our, in our um, system of atoms. So we can locally, for example, have these spins pointing down and some spins that are shown in brown and orange here in the XY plane and turn on the light and um, just watch how the system evolves. And we're measuring it sort of as a function of position the average magnetization in some region of the cloud. Now, Ising interactions should make at the mean field level, these spins in the XY plane process about the spins that are along Z. And um, so what I've shown here is the phase of that precession as a function of time. And from the rate of the precession and the sign of the precession, we can read off um, the strength of the Ising coupling and the sign, is it ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic? Okay. So reading off phase um, colors to see which way it's processing is maybe not super intuitive. So we can also Kind of animate that and you can see depending actually on the sign of a laser frequency we can also have the um, uh, sign of the interaction go opposite directions okay and one kind of uh, possible direction with this that 
I've, you know, we've been thinking of this for a while, we still haven't done it, but I'll just mention that um, this is something where, in principle, if you can have either ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic interactions and optically switch between them, you can do something like implement um, a Heisenberg operator for some um, local perturbation. So maybe W is a local spin rotation, but I could imagine doing um, positive and negative uh, sort of time evolution around that um, to implement the time evolved operator and, and do some measurements um, tomography of the system to ask um, how that operator has spread. So that's sort of one reason you might want to be able to have these switchable sign interactions is this is a, is a way of probing operator growth. Okay, um, that, um, so, so I've kind of shown you so far ways of characterizing the interactions in the system via the dynamics. Um, and this ability to kind of um, locally control an, an image is actually potentially powerful then also for, for watching um, how information spreads. Um, but it's also kind of useful to ask the question, can we, in addition to probing dynamics, also prepare low energy states in the system? So that might be something you would like to do if you want to have some approximation to studying the behavior of, of thermal states. In these cold atom systems, it's not really a system that's coupled to a bath. So it's not always natural to talk about a temperature. Um, but something that you can do is say, if I'd like to prepare a low energy state of the system, then I can um, initialize the system in, let's say, a spin polarized state. That is the ground state of a simple Hamiltonian. That's just a magnetic field in a particular direction. And if I do some kind of a slow quench um, of turning on the interactions um, in, in a way that's relatively adiabatic, that could be a route to preparing a, at least a low energy state um, and with some control in principle by the rate of the quench of, of, of how low. Um, so we were curious, you know, can we prepare low energy states of the system? And in particular, normal, you know, normally when I talk about ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic interactions, I'm thinking about do the spins want to align or anti-align at low energy? Um, so that's also something that we can do in this system. Um, and the general approach is that um, we essentially, again, start with the spins um, uh, aligned along a magnetic field um, and slowly ramp on the interactions and um, essentially watch how that affects the magnetization. Um, so in this particular case, let me first give you an example with no interactions just to orient you. Um, so one experiment we can do is just say, I am going to um, initialize my system with all spins pointing down and I'm going to slowly ramp a magnetic field from the z direction to the x direction. And um, hopefully, if I do that adiabatically, the spins will follow. And if indeed, if I look at the magnetization as a function of the final tilt of the field, I'll see the magnetization going from up to down. That's just kind of a reference measurement um, uh, showing how we um, sort of adiabatically turn on, in this case, a trivial Hamiltonian. We could also ask the question, I see somebody clapping, but I think they probably wanted to ask a question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I want I want yeah. to ask a question. So at this stage, yeah. so, so, it, so sorry, so probably I missed some important information in your talk. So is there uh, is this a uh, is this a Rydberg atoms? No, sorry. Um, if I if I gave that impression, I apologize. So um, this is a system where the interactions are mediated by photons in a cavity. I did put up one slide earlier where I mentioned Rydberg atoms as something I may say a few words about at the end if there's time. That's a different system we work with in our lab. But here, the interactions are non-local interactions that are mediated by light in an optical cavity. And okay, so once okay. I, yeah. okay so, so, so how many dimensionality of in the spatial direction that you are able to go and how large system it is? Is it like 100 system size or? Let, let, yeah, let me go back a little bit. So yeah. it's a good question that you asked. That, um, so um, the experiments I'm showing you so far are in a cloud of um, actually sort of order 100,000 atoms right now. And we're looking at the local magnetization, but we're really looking at some kind of mean field um, dynamics um, and, and um, to demonstrate the control of the interactions. Um, so direction, so, um, and so right now, sort of in every pixel of my image, there are many atoms. Um, Ultimately, what's kind of most interesting from a quantum simulation standpoint is to get to something where we're looking at individual atoms with strong interactions mediated by the light. Um, towards the end of the talk, I won't get to that, but towards the end of the talk, I'll also talk about a regime where we have small ensembles that are interacting with each other and are looking at quantum fluctuations. Um, okay. Did that answer your question? So it's essentially a cloud yeah. of many atoms, and we're yes. looking locally at the magnetization, but each pixel of our image has many atoms in it. I mean, is this a like two Oh, and sorry, sorry. You asked about dimensionality. Yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah. Um, to lowest order, I can think of this as a one dimensional system um, where there is, um, so, so, so in reality, it's three dimensional. Um, the atoms are sort of well pinned um, in their position along the axis of this cavity. Um, uh, there is some amount of transverse motion that can be potentially a source of decoherence transverse to the cavity. Um, right now, I'm just sort of averaging over um, the transverse degree of freedom and asking as a function of position along this cavity axis, um, um, what is the magnetization? And, um, and one of the neat things that we'll sort of get to later is that ultimately the dimensionality is not the physical dimensionality is not necessarily the, the right thing to ask about if the interactions um, are not local. And so, so there's right. also uh, a, a distinction between sort of what is the physical dimension of the system and what is the structure of the interactions we can realize in the system. Right, so, so it, is, it is a graph. So, so another thing I want to ask you that it, is that uh, uh, later you mentioned this phase diagram. So can, are you able to see a phase transition in your system? Um, the, this this theoretical phase diagram? No, no, no. I mean, you mentioned ferromagnetic and, and oh. anti-ferromagnetic later. Good. Um, let me, I think this is actually exactly the right question for the next slide, or okay. I, I'm getting to this on the next slide. So um, why don't I sh sort of say, um, get to the next slide and then ask me again if I haven't answered the question. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, great. Okay. So, th but thank you for the question. Um, I appreciate it. So, um, Okay, so so what I did here so far was something um, fairly trivial. I showed you that we can prepare a spin polarized state that is aligned with some magnetic field. So I sweep the field to a final value and the magnetization tracks it. Now we can ask what happens if we do the same measurement in the presence of interactions, okay? So in addition to ramping the field to some final value, I will ramp on um, interactions. Um, and in this case, I will focus on rising interactions and let's make them ferromagnetic. And so what we see here is that um, as a function now of the tilt of this magnetic field in the presence of interactions, you see a very sharp um, kind of uh, a very sharp line here that if the field is slightly tilted down, all of the spins point down. If the field is slightly pointed up, all of the spins point up. And that is coming about from, from the ferromagnetic Ising interactions. Um, and we can sort of think of the change in the magnetization with respect to this tilt um, right around zero as a, as a measure of the magnetic susceptibility, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, just for, for completeness, if we had the anti-ferromagnetic interactions, you would expect this kind of knife edge that we see in the ferromagnetic case to watch out, wash out, and that is in fact what we see. So um, is there a, a phase transition was the question. So we can now plot this magnetic susceptibility, so the change in magnetization with respect to the tilt. Um, as a function of the interaction strength. So here it is as a function of the, the Ising coupling. And what we expect is that um, in these units, when J over H um, reaches um, a half, there should be a transition to a ferromagnetic phase from the paramagnetic phase. And indeed, we see this magnetic susceptibility diverging um, in a way that is consistent with that expected um, phase transition. Did that answer the question? Actually, yeah, first so, of all. So, but, so, so actually, I want to ask is one well, of the if you observe the phase transition, which expect I expect you can, but the one of the most important quality to characterize the phase transition is the critical exponent. So, are you able to mm, measure the critical exponent and match the existing universality class? And I, you know, this is a, this is a good question, and I have to say that we, in principle, um, this is something that we could look at more carefully. Um, it's not something that we, uh, to some extent, the, our resolution in kind of looking at this divergence is somewhat um, limited presently by s some technical fluctuations. So we did not do sort of a careful enough measurement here that I think it would be sensible to try to fit a critical exponent. But it's a good question and something that um, would be interesting to look at more. Right. So, so I'm interested in knowing how many precision you are able to obtain from this quantum simulation. So, I mean, for instance, if you could match like many, many digits in, and, and uh, agree with a known existing, um, known universality cl class, that will be very cool. So that, that is, um, yeah. So I think I, I appreciate the comment and it's something that we should uh, certainly think about um, 
again, right now our focus was on sort of at least establishing the tunability of the interactions. And I agree that sort of making this more of a precision measurement um, and asking about measuring critical exponents would be a really neat direction to take this. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, maybe I should just add, sorry, one, I guess one thing I can just add is that there is a curve plotted here. And this is just coming from a, a mean field model um, where I essentially um, say that, to, you know, to lowest order, um, because we have this kind of all to all structure of the interactions, there's some weights of the couplings, but it's this all to all structure of the interactions. And I, I kind of wrote it here, but glossed over it to lowest order, I can think of this as some collective spin that has some weighting of the individual spins that depends on their positions. Um, and uh, in terms of just a, a classical model for this collective spin, you can ask what the magnet, how the magnetic susceptibility should behave, and that's what this theory curve is. Okay, um, good. So one kind of fun thing about this, this um, measurement is we can also do it now because we can choose our interactions. We can do it with um, an XY model instead of an Ising model. And it looks like the mirror images image of the Ising model in terms of the magnetic susceptibility. And it turns out that that actually is something that can be understood in this picture of thinking of the, the system of many atoms as a collective spin. Um, if you had exactly symmetric couplings to the cavity mode, then I could say it's just really just one big spin. And um, there's some uh, uh, relation where Fz squared, which is this collective Ising interaction, is the same as an xy interaction of the opposite sign plus some term that just depends on the total spin. And so that's actually why we see this symmetry where the magnetic susceptibility of anti-ferromagnetic xy interactions actually looks the same as the ferromagnetic Ising model and shows the same divergence. Now, for purposes of studying many body physics, um, this, this sounds, this is actually a little bit disappointing because um, I don't really want to just study the dynamics of one large classical spin. Um, and so as a first way to sort of, so, so one question you can ask is, are there regimes where you see a difference between the Ising and the XY case, which says that this picture is breaking down? Um, okay, and so one thing that we can do is ask actually about the dynamical response of the system to an inhomogeneous um, field, which, which starts to break that, um, that symmetry that lets me think of it as a single collective object. Um, here's an experiment where actually there's just a magnetic field gradient across the system, um, no interactions so far as a function of time you see actually some spin spiral winding about the system due to the magnetic field gradient. And um, it turns out if you turn on the spin exchange interactions in this system, um, they completely suppress this phase winding. Um, whereas if you turn on the Ising interactions of the opposite sign, the Ising interactions shouldn't affect the phase winding and they don't. Um, so this is one case where you see a, a, a distinct difference between Ising interactions and spin exchange interactions that actually tells us this picture of just thinking of this as one big collective object is starting to break down. Um, and in particular, to understand why the spin exchange interactions are making the spins stay aligned, one way to think about it is having these um, spin exchange interactions, these XY interactions, is the same as Ising interactions plus a term in my Hamiltonian that gives an energy gap between manifolds of different total spin. And so if I start in a spin polarized state, this will tend to keep me in that um, uh, spin polarized um, uh, state or at least suppress um, um, any shortening of, of the length of the, of the spin vector. Um, and this is actually something that um, uh, has potential applications to sort of protecting coherence in situations where you're using the light to generate an entangled state. Okay, um, so so far, what I showed you, um, you know, we sort of, again, we want to get to quantum many body physics. I showed you that this is a bit more many body. I can't think of it as just a single collective object. Um, but I also want to show you that there's something um, quantum going on. Um, and to do that, um, I um, will tell you one more detail about this, the system we work with, which is that um, each individual atom that um, we are, are using to represent a spin is actually um, a spin one object. Um, and so um, it turns out that that gives some, some richness to the ways that you can manipulate the system um, and not just ask about how um, the uh, magnetization, um, the sort of average magnetization behaves, but you can do an experiment where, for example, you initialize the system with all atoms in the zero state of this spin one, um, spin one system um, and ask, um, um, well, uh, if the cavity just coupled to some collective magnetization, you would think nothing would happen. Um, 
But actually, something does happen in the system. If I work in the regime where I have spin exchange interactions, um, we can see a process where pairs of zero atoms can give rise to pairs of plus one and minus one atoms. So here's um, an experiment where we start with all atoms in the zero state. And um, here are 100 repetitions of the experiment. You'll see large fluctuations in, in what occurs. But um, what you'll see is that on certain shots of the experiment, there's a correlated um, population appearing in the minus one and the plus one state. And that's a signature of a, a process um, where we're essentially, um, by this, this um, F plus F minus interaction, generating correlated atom pairs. Um, if you want to sort of write down a model for this, I tend to like to think of my spin one system as kind of um, the three internal states I can think of as you know three bosonic modes that I call A, B, and C. And I have basically some Hamiltonian where I can take two C atoms, that's the Z M equals zero state, and convert them into a plus one and a minus one atom. And mm -hmm. if you sort of choose an appropriate basis, um, one thing you'll see is that I can think of this as basically two decoupled harmonic oscillators of negative mass or, or unstable harmonic oscillators. And so this, this, this system has an instability to forming actually these correlated atom pairs. Um, and that shows up as sort of an exponential growth in populations in, in these, um, these two states. Um, OK, so this is, you know, similar physics are actually, it turns out, observed, observed also by direct collisional interactions. But the neat thing is we can do this with these non-local photon mediated interactions. Um, and that actually starts to give you the possibility of asking, can we start to dictate um, something about um, the spatial structure of these interactions? And the, and the resulting correlations by optical control. And OK, so, so basically, um, in order to sort of probe that cleanly, we have uh, recently moved towards trapping atoms not in just this single extended cloud, but in an array of small atomic ensembles. Um, and our goal here is to be able to get to the point where we can have, um, um, well, ideally, um, kind of that function generator idea. Wouldn't it be nice if I could program in what the interaction strength is between any um, pair of sites in this system? Um, or somewhat more modestly, program in um, some um, um, form of, let's say, translationally invariant couplings. I would already pretty happy, be pretty happy if I could start to have some control over the strength of interaction versus distance. Um, if you want this order, you can also move around the trapping sites. So, so that already would be a very powerful tool. OK, so how do we do this? Um, so it turns out that um, if we want to have more control over which sites talk to which other sites, the first thing that we need to do in this system is actually sort of turn off the all to all interaction. And then we'll controllably turn it back on. OK, so here's an experiment where I'm, I'm looking at the same pair creation physics. So I initialize the system with all atoms in the zero state. Um, but now I'm applying a magnetic field gradient across the system. Um, and that means that this process of taking two zero atoms and forming a plus one minus one pair is no longer resonant unless the atoms are sitting in the same location. Otherwise, there's an energy cost to doing this. Um, so by turning on this magnetic field gradient, I've created a situation where only um, if an, a plus one atom forms on a given site, that should be correlated with a minus one atom forming on the same site. So if I look at correlations in the populations of plus and minus one atoms versus the site number, I see correlations on the diagonal. So that's saying these interactions and the resulting correlations are, are local. But now we can play a trick where we say, actually, I would like to turn on interactions at some controllable distance. OK, so um, I'd like to turn on interactions at some controllable distance. And to do that, what I do is I turn on two laser frequencies that sort of bridge the energy cost of creating a plus one minus one pair at that distance. So the energy, the frequency difference between these laser fields matches the difference in Zeeman splittings um, um, at these two sites. And now I see these correlations appearing off the diagonal um, at a distance set by the frequencies of those control fields. OK, um, so we can um, now vary that frequency, right? And as we vary the frequency, we can start to control very precisely um, at which distance do these correlations appear. Um, and this is a neat thing because um, this um, can be sort of highly non-local, right? I can turn on interactions at a distance of um, 11 sites, um, but not for nearest neighbor sites. Um, so it's something that is sort of not possible in most quantum systems that you realize in the lab, but that we can do here. And I also just want to highlight kind of the fine control where here we really do have interactions at 
you know, either 11 sites or, or 10 sites, um, and we can, can control um, which, which it is. Um, so good. So, so now we actually have this um, tool for using the laser spectrum to determine the distance dependence of the interactions. And in principle, this actually generalizes to where if I have, um, for example, more drive frequencies, um, I could essentially turn on arbitrary couplings um, versus distance. And sometimes I'm asked by theorists, is this hard turning on more drive frequencies? And the answer is no, it's actually easy um, to control the spectrum of the laser field. Um, I won't show you data where we do it because we've focused so far on asking, do we understand the simple case? Um, um, although we've, we've played a little bit also with saying, okay, I have interactions with, at two distances and, and so you can start to have a richer control over the graph of interactions. So just to look a little bit more at the simple case, um, one thing you might ask is, you know, can you ask questions about how correlations spread once I can control the interaction graph? Um, and one thing we do see is that um, we see not only sort of local, but also longer range correlations, even if the interactions are at some short distance. So if I have interactions at a distance of two sites, I see correlations forming at sort of even a range of even numbered distances. Um, and what we would love to start being able to do is also ask about dynamics and how, how correlations spread under the influence of a particular interaction graph. Um, and I'll just say that sort of very preliminarily, we're starting to ask questions about how do these correlations evolve over time and, um, and have the resolution to see that sort of at short times, um, we have only the local correlations and over time they, they start to um, spread. And this is actually what you'd like to do is be able to say something about how correlations spread. If you want to ask the question, um, can I now engineer the interactions in such a way that I have, um, that I might have fast scrambling and the ability for correlations to spread over the full system in logarithmic time. Okay, so we haven't done that yet. Um, but there, we do have kind of a model in mind for what um, might allow you to do that. And the idea would be that now that I have this ability to dial in with my laser field at what distance is the interaction present, um, one model that might be conducive to fast scrambling would be um, it, sort of with this scheme, it's convenient to have not too many different couplings. That turns out to be um, um, somewhat convenient, but it turns out if I just had interactions for like nearest neighbors, second neighbors, fourth neighbors, and eighth neighbors, say sites at distances that are powers of two, that would already be enough to allow me to kind of in just a few hops, right, to bridge kind of any distance in this system. Um, so this is kind of a toy model um, that we've, um, you know, thought about theoretically, and it has a couple of interesting features. So um, imagine a model where I, I have these um, flip-flop interactions. Um, they're on at distances only that are powers of two, and I have some exponent that determines do they decay or do they are they flat with distance or do they grow. So if they were to decay with distance, it would basically be like a nearest neighbor spin chain. The strongest interactions would be between adjacent sites. Um, if they were flat with distance, and, and so you would see if you sort of, for example, um, started a spin excitation at some point and just asked how it propagates, you would see um, uh, or ask how correlations grow with time, you would see the correlations spreading as a function of time. Um, if you instead have something where these interactions are the same at all distances, then rather than seeing this kind of a linear light cone, you would actually see something where um, the characteristic time scale for correlations to develop between site I and site J goes only logarithmically as distance. Um, so this is kind of, um, saying something about as a function of um, time and now not actually physical distance, but distance um, in sort of the graph of couplings, how many hops does it take to get from site I to J, you would see something that looks like a, a sort of linear light cone. But the point is that if I have this particular structure of couplings, the largest distance in the graph goes only logarithmically as the system size. And so that would be conducive to fast scrambling. Okay, so one more fun thing you can do um, in this toy model is you could ask what happens if interactions grow with distance, with physical distance. And then it seems that this kind of light cone behavior would completely break down. Um, but it turns out, and, and this is um, Steve Gubser's insight into what you could hope to do with this system, um, is that if you go into this regime where the long range couplings are the ones that dominate, it turns out that basically sort of, if I ask sort of what governs the distance the effective distance between sites in this coupling graph, what matters most is kind of the least significant bits of the site indices. So if I have an even site and an odd site in physical space, 
These are far away in the, in the coupling graph. And in that case, there's sort of a more natural way to think about this system, um, which is to say I should think of the sites um, in, in my spin chain, um, I should re kind of rearrange them and think of them as being arranged as the leaves on a tree, um, where sort of um, in order to determine whether I go left or right on this tree, I first look at the least significant bit of the site number and then sort of the next least significant bit and at the end, the most significant bit. And I end up with this completely different geometry. But if you now look at sort of how correlations would spread as a function of distance on this tree, um, all of a sudden I would have this kind of light cone um, appearing again. And that would tell me, that would be sort of a signature of the fact that I have this completely different geometry, this tree-like geometry um, in terms of the coupling graph even though physically my, my sites are just arranged in this chain. So I think this is a nice illustration that with the tools that we're developing for programming the couplings versus distance, you can really start to venture into um, geometries um, that are completely different from sort of the physical geometry um, that we have present in the lab. Okay, and in this model, our understanding is that at kind of this intermediate point between this, there's the, you know, we can tune it to where the geometry would be the spin chain we could tune it to where the geometry is this tree, but somewhere in between, um, the sense of sort of geometry and locality almost completely breaks down, and that's where you expect um, fast scrambling to occur. Um, okay, so this is, um, we can't solve this exactly in a large system of, you know, spin half on each site, um, but if you do kind of look at semi-classical dynamics and ask um, how does the scrambling time depend on system size, it appears to scale um, logarithmically. So that looks promising for studying um, fast scrambling in the lab. So um, yeah, so with that, I've introduced to you kind of a range of different ways that we can program these photon mediated interactions, realizing all to all couplings that have some um, similarity in flavor to SY, SYK, although it's not exactly SYK, um, but also start to program the couplings in a way that might allow you to realize these exotic um, geometries and fast scrambling on a tree-like graph. Did I hear somebody? I think I hear someone maybe asking a question. Is there somebody with a question? Uh, maybe it was a noise. I will try to ask the question after the talk. Okay, great. So then, um, yeah, I'll just briefly give, may, do I have time for just a few slides of sort of outlook? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, great, yeah. So, okay, so um, I've sort of focused on, you know, the knobs we have for controlling interactions. One question you might have are what are sort of the, the ways you could probe the system. Um, and in particular, if you want to probe scrambling, um, there, there are a few different ways that you could do that. Um, so one set of approaches relies on kind of, as I mentioned before, the ability to switch the sign of the interactions to sort of measure a, a butterfly effect. Um, uh, 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 if I perturb the system, does it come back to its initial state or not? So that's sort of one useful tool we have is the ability to switch the sign of interactions. There's another set of approaches that involve basically asking, sort of drawing inspiration from the notion of chaos as sort of sensitivity to initial conditions. In a quantum system, um, one can use that idea to say, actually, if I can prepare many different initial states, and image their evolution, that gives a way of actually um, directly probing how operators grow and probing scrambling. So there have been some nice um, ion trap experiments demonstrating this approach. And I guess I, I just want to highlight that in this system, we do have this ability to kind of locally um, control the spin textures, and that could be a, um, a tool for using this approach to, to probing, probing chaos in the system. Okay, and lastly, there's a set of experiments that have been done in kind of few qubit systems where the concept is basically doing teleportation type experiments um, to probe scrambling. Um, and the key resource for that is this um, thermofield double state where I have um, two systems that sort of um, each independently look like a pure state, but when I look at the correlations, I uh, look like a thermal state, but when I look at the correlations, I see that it's actually a, a pure entangled state. And actually, interestingly, this process of pair creation that I showed earlier in principle, if I if you ask about what the correlation, uh, sorry, what the number of excitation is, excitations is in the plus one and minus one states, um, theoretically this gives rise actually to a state that has this form. It's sort of a trivial example of a thermofield double state of a harmonic oscillator. Um, but that would be interesting to explore more and ask maybe whether you can start with a trivial example and maybe convert it also into something more interesting. Um, 
I'll also just briefly mention, I think, sort of one exciting direction that's recently been proposed by the group of Peter Zoller um, is to measure energy level statistics and specifically measure a quantity known as the spectral form factor that I mentioned this because I think some in, the, in this audience have probably thought about this. Um, and the general idea is that if I have a system of, of qubits and I have, um, I can do a sort of interferometry where one qubit turns on or off the interactions of the surrounding qubits um, that form a many body system I'm trying to probe, those tools actually give you the, the, the um, ingredients for actually directly measuring um, this spectral form factor that says something about the statistics of the energy levels. And that has been proposed to be done in um, systems of Rydberg atoms where you can excite one atom and have it um, strongly influence the surrounding atoms and turn off or on the interactions between them. So I just want to briefly flash up that um, this is, um, we are actually also in a separate experiment um, working with Rydberg atoms. This is a system where we've realized um, essentially a transverse field Ising model so far in a bulk gas of atoms. But this is something that you could, um, that we are moving in the direction of being able to trap these in the way that one could study spin chains um, like let's say Ising models um, in a transverse and longitudinal field. Um, if you want to think more about local models with highly coherent interactions, um, this, this, this could be a nice system where again, one had, can use light to turn on and, on and off the interactions, um, could potentially probe things like random circuit models um, with these optically controlled interactions. And there are even ideas for controlling um, the spatial and time dynamics of the interactions um, to realize something akin to quantum mechanics in curved space. So I think there are um, lots of fun directions one can go once one has um, the ability to program interactions optically. I showed you in detail how we're doing that in the optical cavity system, um, but in terms of sort of um, systems, if you want to focus on local interactions, then I'll just mention that this Rydberg system is, an, is a nice one that could also be relevant. Um, so to summarize, um, I've shown you um, uh, uh, systems of cold atoms where we have the ability to have really a high degree of programmability of the form of, inter of the interaction, the sign of the interaction, and um, most recently, the, the, really the coupling graph um, um, that will allow us to um, explore some uh, models that you, know, might, you might have thought would not be realizable in the lab, but I think we're really getting close now to being able to have um, systems with exotic non-local interactions, um, unusual geometries like this tree-like geometry um, that um, could be the starting point for building some, some toy models of, of quantum gravity in the lab. Um, so with that, I will just thank my team, um, particularly um, Eric Cooper and Avikar Parawell um, are the key people behind um, the latest experiments on programmable interactions. Um, and um, Emily Davis um, was also a, an important contributor who has recently moved on to her postdoc. And Greg Benson um, also, I will say, um, was um, the key person behind especially the theory um, of the um, sort of roots to fast scrambling, um, but also some of the early experiments in the cavity system. So with that, I will conclude and take any questions. OK, thank you. Have a short time for questions. Okay, so uh, um, I have a question um, about uh, your talk. So, so it was a great talk, and um, and but but I think the generic goal of quantum simulation, one of the generic goal is to tell people what is not known in theory. Yeah. So, so do you have any like something like a benchmark quantity that you are able to tell? Kearney, um, that you are able to compute something that is not known by theorists. For instance, something like the Lyapunov exponent of the SYK model at the finite n, finite but large n, might be such a benchmark uh, quantity. And, um, and I'm, I'm not sure if you are able to do something similar and compute something that, uh, um, that the theorist um, theorist does not know and uh, now and maybe in the future? Yeah, so I, I think this is a really great question. And I, I fully agree this is, you know, that that is the goal of quantum simulation. Um, and it's, and there are really sort of a handful of nice examples in the community of cases where experiments have, you know, measured things that, that theorists don't know. But I would say that um, that it's still overall, um, a, I would say the field is at a state where um, there's sort of a first step of getting the level of, of control 
to be able to then kind of venture into, into the unknown. So for us in particular in these experiments, I'll say that probably the, the biggest um, maybe, uh, or one challenge um, is that right now in order to get um, kind of coherent interactions, we do something where we sort of benefit from a collective enhancement of the atom light interaction strength by working with these like small ensembles that are interacting. And that puts us in a regime where um, to lowest order, we do have um, kind of good mean field um, descriptions of, of the dynamics. Um, now, we're so we've been, in some sense, we like that because in order to just um, uh, sort of develop the techniques for control of the interactions, it is convenient to be in a regime where we can calculate what we expect to happen. Um, but the goal is to get in the regime where we can't. And part of that is also starting to get into a regime where we're, um, first of all, measuring quantum fluctuations. And that's um, something that's, um, kind of we're working on is is getting the um, resolution of, of our detection to a point where we're starting to actually measure the quantum fluctuations and being be able to actually characterize entanglement in the system. Um, ultimately, in these um, in this cavity QED system, um, uh, it turns there's sort of upgrades in terms of the strength of atom light coupling in the system that will allow to, us to go to systems of sort of fewer atoms per site where quantum fluctuations become a bigger effect and where um, you would expect sort of these mean field descriptions to be to be worse. So I would say there are things that we can't calculate in the system, um, but um, I'm not quite sure they're the, the things you're interested in. And they're, um, and so far we've sort of intentionally focused on a regime where we can calculate things as a way of um, sort of just, just establishing the control. But I fully agree that that, that should be the goal. Um, it's perhaps more um, near-term accessible in systems like um, I showed at the, at the beginning, these arrays of individual atoms. And so far, the most coherent interactions you can get between those um, are by coupling to, to Rydberg states. Um, and that has then more limitations in terms of the interactions being local. Um, but there you directly um, have coherent interactions between these spin half objects, between individual qubits. And um, in some sense, then you're sort of more directly in a, in a um, strongly interacting many body regime. So I think um, right now I would say we're still we're still building the toolbox um, and um, it's certainly a goal to get to where um, to something that's interesting that you can't calculate. Uh, um, may I have a question? Yeah Wait, yeah one more yeah let's uh, let other people ask questions. So Matt. Uh, hi, thanks hi. for the talk. Um, so did I understand correctly that sort of the, the sense in which the tree model is holographic, right, is that uh, it's sort of um, um, you create some non-local model and I can then sort of interpret correlation functions in this model as being uh, coming from a local model in some tree geometry. It's sort of an imagined uh, tree geometry, right? Uh, yeah, so phys exactly. Physically, there's, yeah, the geometry is this linear sure. chain, but the sort of best way to think of the geometry in terms of the dynamics is, is this tree. Sorry, but I think right, you were still right. asking the question. Yeah, so 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 then also do you do you have control over the the uh, the scaling dimension, say that the S parameter? Because um, one would imagine that yeah. this is related to again in this imagined model the 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 mass of the or the mass squared of some putative scalar field, right? So is the S the size of the spin on each site? No, I I, I was right. thinking the, the S would oh, be the little the, S. Um, the little S. The, yeah. Little s, yes, yes. Yeah. In my model. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, we call that the scaling dimension in some. The, the, this formal... one, the exponent? Yes. What yes. I would call maybe a power law exponent or something. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that um, is just. So essentially, that amounts to basically I have some set of laser frequencies and I just need mm -hmm. to control sort of are they, what what is the envelope on that set of, of laser frequencies? And that's okay. an easy thing to do technically. Yeah. Um, and like I said, the, you know, the reason we haven't done it is we're kind of stepwise um, trying to do things we understand and, and build right. up complexity. Right. Yeah. So, then, so then I would interpret S equals zero as being still on the tree model, but it would be like a like a massless scalar on the tree. Uh, the the um, log correlations are like a two dimensional uh, two dimensional boson, for instance. But yeah, this says a... that sounds interesting. Um, I have to admit, I can. I, I would love to sort of hear more about how you interpret it because that's not something that I've. Yeah. Yeah, you can do a semi-classical calculation on this tree with uh, some mass parameter, and you'll get various values of s. Basically, the dictionary in this setup. I see. Okay. But no dynamical uh, gravity, but you know something. 
similar. So anyway, very interesting. Thank you. That's I would love to chat more about that at some point. But yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, I think we'll have we are over time, so we'll have to finish now. And uh, we can ask the questions by email. Uh, or if Monica is coming to the discussion, we can ask them at the discussion. Um, so let's thank Monica again for a very nice talk.